I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands. One nation under God. Indivisible. Liberty and justice for all. Roll it. gentlemen what is going on and welcome back to another episode of the one the only the point as always i'm your boy ricky b and on the other side of this screen of course is your boy the man the myth the legend and one half cannot forget one half of the combat universal tag team champions uh got a big match coming up this weekend yeah i do gonna be exciting title title defense against who uh, that's my, that was my question too. Who? Right. The altar <laughs> boys. Yeah. The, yeah, the altar boys. Yeah. Play a prophecy or something. Right, 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 right. So, uh, everybody make sure you check out combat universal promos on YouTube. Give them a, a like, a subscribe, a share, all that good shit. And make sure you check out the show. I think it's Saturday, Saturday, eight o'clock, somewhere in that general area. If not, I may be wrong, but if you subscribe, you'll get the notification you want to rely on these lips. So moving right along, not that that's a bad thing. We're going to jump right into this. So coronavirus is still going on, the pandemic, the hysteria, bullshit. Uh, the draft. Draft is a big issue, man. Um, this year's draft is going to be a historic one, uh, to say the least. Uh, not going to be able to meet face to face like they have in years past, and they're not only they're not going to be able to dig into the backgrounds as much as they used to either because of the face to face thing and the social distancing. So, what are you? How are you feeling about the, the NFL draft this year? Definitely going to be interesting. Um, I'm not sure if I'm 100 percent on this or not, but I believe that the WNBA done something similar to this uh, a little while back. Um, but to see it in the NFL is definitely going to be interesting, especially with this class that's coming up. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, no doubt. Now, I did see something that uh, caught my eye. I saw, uh, for one, Peyton Manning was giving shout-outs to you know, Barrow. <clears throat> I believe it was, uh, talking about how good he could be. But then we saw, I can't pronounce the guy's name off the top of my head, but the guy who uh, – Injury prone, expected to fall down through the cracks a little bit. Tua? Tua. Exactly, Tua. Um, so there is some movers and shakers, and there, there's some stuff going on, you know, coming up on the NFL draft on the horizon and everything. But, again, I think it's all going to be overshadowed again by the fact that this is going to be a unique draft. And I, I say unique. <clears throat> it's going to be unique for this generation because he – this is the kind of draft that we saw years ago when we were little tykes. You know, th- this was the kind of draft we saw. We didn't see a lot of this pomp and circumstance with the suits and the, who's got the best socks and all that shit. It was just down to brass tacks. You know, there was a helmet up there and it was, you know, wired phones. I know you, a lot of you guys and you kids out there right now don't understand what the hell that is, but the phone actually plugged into the wall. And uh, these guys were putting in work. And uh, now we're going to kind of get back to that. So, hey, all the retro stuff's coming back into style. <laughs> there you Barry, go. Uh, not Barry Sanders, but, um, <coughs> well, shoot, Bo Jackson made that famous with his uh, Sports Center cover picture when he was sitting there talking on his ESPN, the magazine football phone kickback. Yeah. Absolutely, man. One one of the all time greats. Went ahead and uh, recreating that picture. Yeah, I mean, I, I that's one of my all time favorites, man. Uh, we were talking about that the other night. You know, so uh, love that guy, man. 
But uh, most pro timing days uh, were canceled, and the league prohibited teams from doing in-person interviews with prospects. So the league has taken steps to minimize face-to-face. So, again, keep your eyes peeled because the NFL draft is going to be something to watch. And whether you like it or not, whether it's entertaining or not, it will be historic. So make sure you, you know, tune in, watch. Don't don't shy away from it because again, if you call yourself a fan of football, drafts happen. It's going down. So make sure you there. You got your eyes peeled for it. Now, um, I, the NASCAR. I say the NASCAR again. I say the in front of everything because I'm getting old now. I mean, we we covered this before. <laughs> The Facebook, the Twitter, the NASCAR. So let's jump right into this. I'm sure you've heard. Matter of fact, you hit me up and told me about this. You know, the, I can't. I'm sure you know his name. I don't know his name, but uh, apparently there was a NASCAR driver, this I Racing Series, that uh, they had a virtual race. And apparently there was a NASCAR racer that uh, used a racial slur. Kyle Larson. Yeah, apparently it's a big deal. Of course, anytime you you got an ignorant asshole like that, it's a big deal. But he he uses a racial slur in the NASCAR. They did not bat an eye, man. They cut this dude loose quickly, and rightfully so. But uh, I don't know if you heard. They were on their – all the drivers were on their best behavior in NASCAR's latest virtual race. Um, No one did anything to get fired or lose the sponsor. Uh, but the I Racing Series had a you know sour taste. The Bubba Wallace uh, lost a sponsor for quitting in a game and in a rage. And Kyle Larson, of course, with the racial slur we talked about. But Sunday's the event was uh, at Richmond Raceway was low on drama. William Byron, never heard the name. William Byron won for the second consecutive race. So the guys on the roll. Most excitement came when Matt uh, D. Benedetto was parked for intentionally crashing Ryan Priest and the two then engaged in a Twitter spat. Because that's what you do. That's what you do now. That's what adults do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. adults these days, we we don't fight. We don't put these up. We get on Twitter and give them a what for. It's the good old days of, uh, you know, the Allison boys going out and jumping out of their cars and mixing it up with Kale Yarborough and beating each other with helmets. Absolutely. Uh, uh, speaking of Allison, you just brought back memories, man. Davy Allison. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> Davy and Bobby Allison always mixing it up with uh, Kale Yarborough and Neil Bonnet. It seemed like every week they were crashing each other and duking it out in the infield. You know, I'm going to give a shout out right now. Call it a cheap plug, whatever you want to call it. I have two uncles. I have... My biological father's brother, and then my biological father's sister's husband. Uh, his name is, we call him Homer. His name is Henry King. And, of course, my biological father's brother is George Bickle Jr. So we call him Jr. Um, both of them awesome guys, man. Very instrumental in my upbringing. Both excellent, 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 excellent basketball players. Uh, but they are huge racing fans. And, you know, growing up, Uncle George or Junior, he was a NASCAR fan, uh, of course, and uh, he was a fan of Dale Earnhardt. And then, of course, on the other side, you had Homer. Henry was a, a fan of Davy Allison, diehard fan of Davy Allison. Of course, heartbroken as we all were when the accident happened and Davy uh, unfortunately lost his life. But, man, Every Christmas, every holiday, we got together. It was basketball. You know, it was a game of 21. You know, it was hardcore. And then it was time to go sit down, eat a little holiday food, and watch the race. And I've never been a NASCAR fan per se. I think we've covered that. (laughs) But uh, those guys, that's what it reminds me of every time I hear the Allison name. So I I couldn't, couldn't help but speak on it and shout their names out. Hey, guys, love you both. Uh, appreciate the hell out of y'all. Hope you're doing well right now. Love you. But uh, NASCAR's, uh, they're trying to make waves, man. Yeah, man. Look, 
my uncle raced NASCAR before it was NASCAR when it was ARCA. Um, ever since NASCAR got rid of the Winston Cup and they went to the stupid chase and all that, I can't do it. Um, and then ever since Junior had to retire, that was just kind of the icing on the cake for me. I watched the Daytona 500 this year. Um, that's really about it. I, I tried to keep up with it, but, um, you know, now going with the video game nonsense. Yeah. they've just they've completely lost me yeah so refresh my memory this i racing series these are not this is not actual races right basically what they're doing is putting these guys in simulators and they're racing just like they were at the track so nice. say say next week is talladega they're going to get into their simulators. They're going to simulate everybody at Talladega. They're all going to be on the exact same uh, motherboard, I guess. I don't know the technical damn thing. And they're going to race just like they were at Talladega. Okay. Well, you know, I guess much like the rest of the sports world, um, like sports entertainment with WWE, AEW, and all the other pro wrestling companies, all the other sports companies, they're, they're trying to find their niche during this bull, this BS that's going on right now. So hey, I, I give them props. I give them props. You're going to have winners emerge that wouldn't have won otherwise. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a shit stain on the, 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 uh, the NASCAR world. I understand that. But from what I understand, NASCAR world's been struggling as it is. So it's not like really had a whole hell of a lot to lose so but anyway the big thing that everybody's talking about right now and rightfully so and this is going to be a, a a big portion of what we talk about tonight because it's the hottest thing going on right now and that is the big 10-part docuseries uh michael jordan's career which by the way not that he needs it from me, not that he needs it from you, not that he'll ever see it. But I'm going to give a shout-out right now to Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, he's a local boy here in North Carolina from Wilmington, Laney High School. Um, my, We were just talking about it earlier, my, my biological father, who's also Rick Bickle, his sister Teresa, went to UNC Wilmington at the same time Michael Jordan went to UNC Charlotte, which is, uh, I mean, Chapel Hill, I'm sorry, which is, how in the hell? Chapel Hill, UNC, Tar Heels, please forgive me. I prostrate myself before you and beg for your forgiveness. Um, he went, he was at, starting at UNC at the same time she was at UNC Wilmington. And he would often go down there to the beach during the summer and play pickup games. Of course, he was a nobody then. I mean, he wasn't a nobody, but he wasn't Michael Jordan. Right. He was still, you know, still Mike back then. Um, so I used to hear about it a lot, man, when I was a kid. And I started watching Mike from a very young age, man, uh, a very young age. People forget just how long he played, but uh, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit. But – Past all that, we'll get into the meat and potatoes of what I'm talking about here with the last uh, the last dance. I'm not going to go back to the whole series or, or the, the whole episodes and things like that. But one of the things I wanted to touch on, and, like, and again, give a shout out to Michael Jordan, because a lot of people don't understand. You hear Michael Jordan's name, you know he's great, he's one of the greatest, blah, blah, blah. And you know him more so from his shoes and the endorsements and all the social media and all that shit. People really don't understand or grasp the concept or the sacrifice that it took both on and off the court to become Michael Jordan. Right. The basket, you know, the basketball player. Um, so I'm gonna give a shout out to him right now. Nothing but mad respect. I, I never missed a game. I never missed a game. I didn't give a damn what it took. Uh, with an antenna, whatever it was, I never missed a game, uh, especially the 72-10 and 10 year. Uh, I watched every single game on WGN, and the ones that weren't on WGN I found elsewhere 
or had a buddy or two record them and paid them for the tapes and got them. I, I just Michael Jordan was my life. And uh, so anyway, moving on. So the show debuts. Uh, again, understand we record this show. When you're watching it right now, it's Tuesday. But for us, it's you know, it's Monday. It, it, the show debuted Sunday night. Um, man, I got to tell you, I've never been more excited for a documentary series in my life uh, for obvious reasons that I've already mentioned. I will say that one of the first things that surprised me is it was unedited. Right. When I say unedited, it wasn't censored. And for me growing up, watching Michael Jordan, he was this wholesome guy. You know? And we all know that's BS because you know, we all use language and stuff that, you know, most people wouldn't, if they heard us talking behind the scenes, they'd be like, man, damn, Rick talks like that. But that's human nature, right? Um Within the first 10, 15 minutes of the show, I heard Jordan drop an F-ball. And, and it just, I was still that little Ricky, that little kid, you know, watching the show. And it it, it took me off guard and it kind of cheapened it at first. And then as I started watching the show, it made me feel Michael even more. Um, but one of the things I wanted to touch on real quick, and I, Mike is a businessman. Okay, so this was this shit was orchestrated. Okay, it didn't happen. It wasn't a knee jerk. LeBron James, let's do a Gatorade commercial. This shit was orchestrated way back when the season was going on. They orchestrated this with recording content in anticipation of 20 some years later, you know, actually doing this documentary. So. What does Michael Jordan do? What does, uh, excuse me, what does Nike do in collaboration with Michael Jordan? Last night at the debut, last night our time, the debut of this documentary series, they drop a surprise drop of the Jordan V. Jordan, I believe that's five, right? Yes. Yeah, the V. I'm an idiot. I'm not, I'm not good with the Roman numbers. But they did a surprise drop of the Jordan 5s for Last Dance, predictably. You want to take out a guess how fast it, how long it took for them to sell out? Oh, probably eight minutes. Before the end of the opening credits, they were sold out. And that is where Michael Jordan has made his empire. Last time I checked, LeBron makes a lot of money, but last time I checked, his shoes don't sell that fast. Just putting it out there. Oops. So what's your opinion on this whole last dance scenario and everything? It's kind of refreshing, right, bringing all these facts back from our childhood? Yeah, I mean, I haven't got a chance to watch it yet. Um, they haven't dropped the link yet. So I'm kind of behind. Um, I've been trying to kind of catch up on everything that I see through, obviously, Twitter, Facebook, and all that. But, um, you know, it's definitely cool. It's different. Um, The one thing that I want to say is not only big props to Michael Jordan, but even bigger props to Scottie Pippen for being a guy that on that team you were freaking making seven years and $18 million. You were the lowest paid guy on that freaking team with Luke Longley for crying out loud. <laughs> hey, look, we're going to touch on that a little bit more here later on in the show because I have a take on that that may piss some people off. But nonetheless... Yes. Um, to think that he was in the position he was in monetarily uh, with that scenario being the beast that he is, um, and the basketball IQ and mind he has. That's mind just insane. It's mind there was a lot of things that I learned that I was 
completely unaware of yeah. that whole situation. Um, you know, even up to the whole, I'm sure we'll get to this later too, the whole Tracy McGrady situation. I was, I had never heard of that until then. Yeah. You know, it, and again, we'll touch on it later. So I don't, I don't want to talk about it too much now, but, uh, yeah, there was a lot going on with uh, with Scottie Pippen, and I remember the scenario then. And as a, you know, I was younger then, so I didn't understand the money part of it. Yeah, I was just pure heart sport, you know, innocent, naive Bulls fan. Go get it, kind of thing, hanging on every on every dribble. Um, but to see that come back to light, uh, it, it's really cool. It's nostalgic, man, and I. These are the kind of documentaries we need more of. Yes. And I can't I can't wait for twenty years from now when we're doing documentaries on how LeBron has chronic cramps and and uh you know his stock value in maxi pads and all that good stuff. But all right, m- moving on. CBSSports.com. I'm gonna give them a shout out right here. CBSSports.com. Of course, they couldn't resist making at least some part of the last dance about LeBron James. Okay. Oh, of course. Now, of course, you know, you knew LeBron was going to pop up in here somehow, some way. Uh, and to LeBron's credit, it wasn't his doing this time. Um, <laughs> yet. Yeah, yeah. You know, the comment was made. This is a quote, direct quote by CBSSports.com. Quote, was LeBron getting one ring closer to matching his, his mythical six titles a driving force in Jordan wanting to create something that would truly capture his greatness? Or was this just a weird coincidence? Probably the latter. But as competitive as Jordan still is, you can't roll out the former as a possibility. Either way, it's an interesting anecdote to the story. End quote. What the hell does that have to do with anything about the last... Look, yes, is Michael Jordan competitive? Yes. Is he the greatest to ever do it? Damn skippy he is. That's my personal opinion. But LeBron James doesn't even register on Michael Jordan's radar. And I'm not going to get into that debate, but the truth is the damn truth. I mean, let's, let's be honest here. You think Michael Jordan gets up every morning thinking about all right, how can I make myself appear to be better than LeBron? You know, CBS Sports, shame on you. CBSSports.com, shame on you. So we talked about it a second ago. We're going to kind of get into it a little bit. Um, about the Pippen situation, I, again, I know about it at the time, but, you know, watching the first two episodes of The Last Dance, you know, it showed just how you know, shitty the situation really was. Uh, is poor decision making on Scottie Pippen's part, or was it taking the deal for seven years at such a low ball price tag? Um, was that desperation? Hold that thought. We're going to take a break real quick and we'll come back and we'll jump into that Pippen deal and talk a little bit more about everything that's going on in the sports world. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in. Stay tuned for the second half of the point. And again, you know, we love you. We've got to take a break. That's how it rolls around here. That's what we got to do. But uh, real quick, before we go to break, give a shout out to your match again this weekend. The show is called. It is Promo Super Clash, presented by RPA and CU. Renegade Promo Alliance and Combat Universal Promos will be seen on Combat Universal Promos YouTube yes. channel. It's- and as well as the other deal. So, again, the union, myself, I mean, not myself, Haystacks and his partner, the Rising Sun, the current tag team champions taking on the Altered Prophecy. Make sure you tune in, click, like, subscribe, share all that shit. Stay tuned. See you on the flip. next week for another action-packed episode of Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for staying with The Point, the one and only. Again, 
your man Haystacks and your boy Ricky B. I'll gladly take a back seat to my man here because he's currently holding gold and I'm not. <laughs> but uh, thank you for staying tuned again. Appreciate you. We're going to try to jump right back into this. So we were talking about Scottie Pippen. We talked about that earlier, the whole scenario back in the day with the, the final run, the last dance, if you will, uh, with the Bulls. Uh, one of the things that I look back on now and I think, yeah, I'm not going to put words in Scotty's mouth, but I think if he's looking back on and being truly honest with himself as well, and there was a whole dynamic going on with Krause and all them guys. But I think Scotty, if he has one regret, it would be that you know, when he had the injury, he knew he had the injury going into the offseason before that final season uh, with this big run, the 97-98 season. He waited until the last minute of the summer to have the surgery, just to be an ass, uh, to prove a point. And, and he made his point. His point was well made. Don't get me wrong. But I think if he had one regret, he'd go back to the beginning of the summer, have that surgery so he'd be ready in time for the season to begin. Because, he, you know, let's face it, man, basketball, like every other sport, is a team sport uh, for the most right. – not every sport. But for the most part, man, and that that really hurt the team to start that season because I remember watching it as a fan, and even though you have Superman on the team, brother, I, halfway through the season they were struggling. Yep, they were struggling, and it it was no, there was no if ands or buts about it. It was because Scottie Pippen wasn't there, and even when he came back, man, it took a while to get them gelling. Now, now, thankfully, because of the mindset of all the guys on that team, you know, the Steve Kerrs, you know, the Tony Ku coaches, the you know, the Pippins, the Robins, the Jordans, the mentality of wanting to win another championship and Phil Jackson's leadership, you know, it got them through and they gelled faster than most. But let's touch on this contract deal. Um, was it poor decision-making on Pippins' part? Or you know, taking a deal seven years for such a low ball price, was that desperation and needing the money? Because I kind of heard from Pippin's mouth, I kind of heard more last night on, the, on those episodes um, that it was more of you know, him wanting to concrete or cement his financial stability in his family. Um, I don't know, man. I, I put more of the blame on Pippin because – at the, at, you know, let me say this, and I'm gonna get your opinion. I know I'm getting long-winded here. Listen, me and you, we put ourselves in that situation, knowing the lives that we live and the money we make right now. We we both live okay, but we're not rich by any means. Um, if someone offers you 18 million dollars for seven years, that's more than we'll ever make in our lifetime. Right. But compared to what he was worth, and you have to understand, he didn't know what he was worth. Maybe he didn't have proper representation at the time. Maybe he was being told by Krauss and uh, other members of management that, well, you're not really worth that, blah, blah, blah. I mean, if, if I'm worth that and you put a contract in front of me for way less, that's got to mess with you a little bit, man, especially when you're a guy that come from nothing, rags to riches, so to speak, and you're seeing millions not really paying attention to the numbers in front of the word million. Uh, you're just thinking, man, I made it. Let me sign this thing. But as a whole, looking back on the history of sports, especially given that time frame, Jordan, I think it was, what, $36 million for one year? Yep. And you got Scottie Pippen, you know, years prior to that, taking a seven-year deal for, what was it, 18? Yeah, 18 mil. And then you look at what he produced on the court. And, I mean, I can go through it, but I'm not. Dude, he was one of the greatest to play the game. He was the Batman to the Superman. I mean, he was the ride or die. You know, back then it was Batman, Superman, Rodman. And, um, man, I don't know. What's your thoughts on that? Somebody, whoever his agent is, his agent should be ashamed, number one. But here, here's the way that I kind of look at it, too. If he didn't 
take that deal, would they have been able to keep Kerr? Would they have been able to sign Rodman? Would, would those last two or three seasons have even been possible had he taken a bigger deal? That, that, that's true. I, I, I see where you're going with that. Um, but, you know, we'll never know, I guess you could say. I, I guess we'll never know because much like Tom Brady, the Patriots, you know, as much as, you know, I, I, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. I get tired of hearing, you know, the, I think, honest to God, I think I'm more of a Tom Brady fan now that he's not with the Patriots. That makes sense. Even though he's now in, in our division with the Panthers, uh, being a Bucks, a Bucks player, but you just get tired of hearing the same shit over and over and over again. And, uh, but, but with Tom Brady, a lot of people don't know he took, way less money than he was worth for years and sacrificed for all those Super Bowl rings. Yep. You know, people think, well, if I work hard and I bust my ass to get to the NBA, then I've made it. No. When you get there, that's when the work begins. It's just like being a champion in the wrestling world or the promo world. The work to get there is nothing. To, once you get there and you have it, and you can speak on this, because you're a current tag team champ to have that title and carry that title. The stress begins when you have that first title defense or hell, when you first, when you win the title celebration sort short lived because the, that's when the work truly starts. Um, you know, I, I have three world championships to my name, uh, fortunately, and I know how it feels, man. Even when you're not a part of that organization anymore, you obligated to some degree, to go back and help promote and, and you know, kind of had that obligation. Tom Brady fulfilled that with the Patriots. Um, so by him taking less money, by default, he was kind of that guy. Yep. But if he, if he would have had a higher contract, then the other guys would have had to settle for more. I mean, for less. And let's face it. Let's face it. If I'm a basketball player, and I've made it to the NBA. The Bulls have won five champions, or excuse me, well, whatever it was when he signed the contract, three championships, two championships. Doesn't make a damn. Uh, one championship for that matter. And they come to me and go, look, we'd like you to play for us. There's the first bonus. Second bonus is you're going to be playing with Michael Jordan. You're going to be playing with Jordan and Scottie Pippen. Um, but – the downside is we can only pay you four million for two years. Okay. Where where do I sign? Yep. Because even if I'm sitting on the bench, guess what? One day I'm gonna tell my grandkids I was a Chicago Bull. I was sitting on the bench, but I was there. I was in practice. I rubbed elbows with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, two of the greatest, and Steve Kerr, three of the greatest basketball minds in the world today and, and and history proves as much but i don't know man but i thought that was an interesting point to touch on now i want to touch on something else real quick uh moving on down the pipeline there's there's eight more episodes to come on the last dance and i can't wait to see them brother i am hanging by a thread um just i can't wait to see it but one of the biggest things that i thought that uh One of the biggest things that I thought um, about this last dance before we move on is that for the sports world, I thought this was kind of a, an interesting concept and, and a funny little thing. And maybe this is me taking a jab at LeBron James. Maybe. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But it's the truth. Even now, years after his retirement, here we are. In the middle of COVID-19, pandemic taking over the world, LeBron's nowhere to be found, but out of nowhere, here comes Michael Jordan, single-handedly saving sports and keeping us interested. I just thought that was a an interesting note to throw out there. Because even in his retirement, he's still doing his thing. 
Here's another fun fact. After the uh, first set of documentaries went off, I believe it was Jeff Van Gundy who was quoted as saying, if Michael Jordan was to be in this era of the NBA, he would go out there and score in excess of 40 points per game. Oh, absolutely. You watch any of that old footage, and if anybody takes anything away from The Last Dance outside of the documentary itself, watch all the video footage. Watch the fast breaks. Watch the play sets. Watch the triangle offense. Watch how many times Jordan takes more than two steps. Watch his spin moves. Watch his footwork. Watch the dribbling. Watch his handles. None of the players today can hold a candle to the roles he played by, the fouls. Now, don't get me wrong. He was Michael Jordan. He got away with some shit. He ain't perfect. But you compare that next to what LeBron gets away from. With I've seen LeBron come across center court, take four steps without ever putting the ball on the floor after catching a pass. The whole crowd erupt in booze, and they play yeah. on like nothing ever happened. So. All right, moving on. So we know, you know, the sports world has been absolutely affected and devastated by this COVID-19 coronavirus. And I'm not going to spend too much time talking about COVID-19. But one of the byproducts or or side effects of this pandemic is, you know, the gambling world. The gambling world has in and of itself – taking an ass whooping, just like every other aspect of sports. The funny thing, however, that I I noted this week is that what the gambling world has resorted to to keep up its profits (laughs) and uh, to keep business going, I guess you could say. Oh, God. Are you ready for this? I want to hear your opinion. What do you think the main attraction of the gambling world has been since all of this has started? Probably how many how many freaking babies are going to be born during quarantine? Believe it or not, the main attraction of the gambling world for the past month has been table tennis. Oh, good God. And there's a reason for this. There's a very, very political reason for this. A uh, very scientific reason. Um, DraftKings head of sportsbook Johnny Avello, uh, he said international table tennis matches have been continuing throughout the global quarantines, and they're one of the few live events that betters can get legal odds, legal odds on from sportsbooks in the U.S. So table tennis, and table tennis is not by itself. If you remember, I'm sure you heard that uh, at the last presidential debate, the Democratic debate, because let's just face it, on the Republican side, there's only one, and in the end, there'll only be one, but we're not talking politics here. But they were actually doing legal betting on how many times each candidate would say certain things. So that's what we've come down to in in, in in the gambling world, which proves the point that we were going to be entertained one way or the other, whether it's yep. scratch offs, whether it's you know table tennis or what the hell ever. But so I thought that was a good note to touch on. But you know we we, we like to talk about every week that we touch on a little bit of everything, and I know we miss a lot of topics. Uh, but one of the things we always talk about is sports entertainment. You know the wrestling, the pro wrestling community, and. And, and as we know, you know, the pro wrestling community has definitely taken an ass whoop. Um, WWE being the biggest uh, pro wrestling company in the world, um, right up there, close to, you know, still number one, but not far behind, of course, is New Japan. But WWE just recently had to make some hard decisions. And... Yeah. Boy, did they. Uh, Vince McMahon held a meeting with all his talent, as well as his producers and and, um, stuff behind the scenes, and 
they come to the stark realization and the hard choice that they had to cut a lot of talent, man. They had to cut a lot of employees in general. Um, I won't name every single one of those off, but I'm gonna try. I'm gonna run down a small list I have here that has effectively been released, and this is talent. Uh, and I'll give you the names that you recognize them by. Uh, Drake Maverick, Kurt Hawkins, Carl Anderson, Luke Gallows, Heath Slater, Aiden English. Didn't know he was even still there. Eric Young, which is a shame. EC3. Damn, EC3, man. Uh, Leo Rush, Kurt Angle, uh, Sarah Logan, uh, referee Mike Kyoto, Primo, Epico, both Colognes, of course, Carlito. Oh. Um, Rowan. Rowan was released. Uh, Mike and Maria Canellis, Zach Ryder, No Way Jose, Rusev, and a couple of uh, guys from overseas that you know hadn't really got started yet. Um, I don't know if you know or heard that some of the producers that were released, or excuse me, furloughed, were Fit Finley, uh, Shane Helms, um, and I can go down the list. There, there's several of them behind the scene. I also heard. It's not on my list here, but Mickey James and a couple other females as well. Dana Brooke, I believe. Um, there's a couple other females that were released as well. And Mickey was at this point working as a producer backstage and talent, you know, stuff like that, trainer. But um, it hasn't been made for sure known if they've been furloughed or if they've actually been let go. But I do know this. Jim Ross on his uh, Grilling JR podcast basically said, uh, you know, asked him where, where would he think that all these talent would end up. JR said in typical JR fashion that he wants to see Rusev in AEW. Um, he That's said right. That he, in all honesty, was probably the best thing to happen to Rusev and Lana. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, when I when when people hear this, when when we talk about this, people are going to say you have to think outside the box. When you think of Rusev, you think WWE Rusev. Think Brody Lee. Okay, you remember what he was in WWE. Now look at what he is in AEW. He would have never had that opportunity. So you have to understand, there's a person behind the character. So now that shell is off. Shell goes in the trash. The man goes over to AEW. I want to see Rosif in AEW. I do. Because then we'll know for sure if, if he really does have what it takes. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, to, to be able to get out of that trash storyline is huge for him and Lana. Um, the interesting thing is, is now that they've been released, once they get back full steam ahead, what's going to happen with Bobby Lashley? Well, uh, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. You know, it's not good to assume. You make an ass out of you and me, right? But with what they've done with Lashley, uh, it would be nice to keep him, at least for a mid-card, even though he should be heavyweight. But, man, the fan in me wants two to of the see three, him. Two of, the, two of the people that he's been running storylines with just got cut. Leo oh, Rush. Yeah. So now he's just kind of flapping in the breeze. I mean, me personally, the fan in me, that uh, I'd like to see him get released because I'd like to see a Bobby Lashley in AEW because let's face it, can you, can you imagine? that They've got a couple of big dudes over there. And you know, the rub alone from this guy, man, it, it would be insane. What impact done with him? Huh? Look at what impact done with him. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what's the guy's name? Um God, forgive me. I know he'll kill me. Um, the Luchasaurus. Ah, picture, yeah. 
Fix your Luchasaurus in a damn mat in a storyline with Bobby Lashley. Yeah. Think of MJF's bodyguard in a in a, in a uh, storyline with Bobby Lashley. Uh, man, it, it would be insane. But you know, again, sports world continues to reel from the effects, the economic effects of COVID nineteen, and uh, these talent are being released. And I don't think these will be the last. I, I really don't. Um, nope. They're gonna. In order to maintain, you know, work around the campfire as Vince has come to, you know, he's had a, an epiphany, so to speak, or a moment of clarity, as alcoholics would refer to it, that he can no longer worry about buying up all the talent to keep them from going to AEW. He's had that realization, and that's why this is starting to happen. Let's face it, Vince McMahon, he's a businessman, so at the end of the day, if it affects his wallet, he's going to make cuts where they're necessary. And, you know, at the end of the day, it is a business. It's a business. So, um, hopefully AEW is smart. This helps boost their talent pool. And uh, we can get back to the good old-fashioned Monday Night Wars. True story. True story. So, we've had a lot of death in the uh, pro wrestling world here lately. Yeah. Sure. sure you know what I'm talking about when I'm getting at. In fact, you can probably pick up where I'm getting ready to say. Yeah, man. There's been crazy death going on all over the world. i just seen today, as I was actually watching Green Acres, Tom Lester passed away. Yeah, I, I was actually watching an episode. <sighs> it's insane, the amount of people that have passed away here recently. I want to give a heartfelt, um, <laughs> just send my thoughts and prayers out uh, from the point, uh, myself, behalf of myself and Haystacks, to the uh, Finkel family. Yeah. Uh, the Fink, Fink, man, talk about a loss. Um, Howard Finkel uh, died April 16th. He's 69 years old. Uh, he had had a stroke. 2019, February 2019, and uh, he never really got over it. He's been in poor health ever since, but he, you know, he fought his ass off all the way to the end. So, you know, again, prayers to his family and friends, and I, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Anybody who's a wrestling fan, anybody who's a WWE fan, um, a sports fan in general, you know, Fink started his career in 1975, man. That's how long he had been around. And um, you don't realize how somebody such as a ring announcer uh, touches you or has a big part of your life. Um, people don't understand it right now, but JR, um, he's an AEW commentator right now. He's still living. He suffers from Bell's palsy, catches a lot of shit for it. But he's still doing his thing. He can barely move his face, and he's still one of the greatest announcers in the world. Let that sink in for a second. Shout out to you, JR. Love you, man. Uh, when JR, when the day comes, hopefully a long, long, long time from now, when JR is dead and gone, um, that's when people will understand and realize the impact that JR has had on the pro wrestling world. You go back. And, hey, don't take my word for it. Go to WWE Network, pull up Batista, Triple H, WrestleMania 21, or, it, or any of the matches that JR called Stone Cold. Watch the match, right? Mute the TV, watch the match from beginning to the end. Then unmute it, start it over. Totally different experience. All because of JR, with, of course, the help of you know, the King. But still, Howard Finkel, even though he, he wasn't a commentator, he was a ring announcer. Fink was involved in storylines. He, uh, he was a showman. He was one of the greatest to ever do it, if not the greatest to ever do it. And, you know, I'll sum it up like this. Lillian Garcia. Um, and, I man, there's so many other ones I can name. You don't realize the impact and how special they are to the product you're watching until they're gone and tired. And then, and then they finally pass away like the bank unfortunately did. And 
you know, it made me reflect on all the matches that he, you know, he announced uh, growing up. So, man, that one touched me pretty deep. I'm not going to lie. Yep. Uh, so, again, thoughts and prayers to his family and friends. And, you know, we've lost a lot of – Scotty Haystacks, we've lost a lot of legends here lately. Uh, La Parca, and not the one that yeah, everybody thinks, La Parca too. Um, and, of course, you know, Rocky Johnson, man, and, you know, the Rock's father. And we lost uh, Rip Oliver. I didn't know a lot about Rip Oliver, but I, I've researched it. Um, I think Rocky Johnson was probably one of the biggest recently that we've lost. But we, we're losing a lot of them, man. So today, one of the uh, – I actually seen that Bobby Fulton had made a post. I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. I can't pronounce it. Joe, uh, Joe Petticone. He was yes. a, he is a ring announcer for WCW. He passed right. away this morning. Yes, I did see that. And again, so, thoughts and prayers. Uh, thoughts and prayers. Because, uh, again, everybody knows I'm a WCW guy, man. I've always been a WCW guy. So, But hate to close the show on a somber note. But oh, it, we're I don't not. Think, I don't think not. it's a somber. Oh, yeah? Oh, no, we're <laughs> not. Because you're forgetting one thing. What's See, that? We're talking about we're talking about the promo world. We're talking about the wrestling world. You forgot one minute detail. When you guys are tuning in this Saturday to watch Super Clash, go one video back because there's a guy that me and you both know that just had a big night for himself. Ah, the hell with that. Yeah, hell with that. The guy, the guy staring at me right now was the first ever inductee into the CU 2020 Hall of Gods. Congratulations on that. And it was a honor and a privilege to be the guy that inducted you into that situation. There was nobody more deserving. It was a hell of a night. Um, you know, Junior and Chris made the made an appearance. Um, it was a good show, man. And there's nobody in the damn promo world right now that I see that uh, would deserve to be the number one man to go into that hall and stand alone. Yeah, hey, hey man, I appreciate that. You had me going there at first. I was like, what the hell is he talking? But <laughs> you knew you wasn't yeah. gonna get off of here. Without me throwing that in there, I mean, yeah. we're, we're we're talking about us. We're talking about a group that we're averaging a couple hundred views, and within the first three hours, because this guy's face is on it, we shoot up to like six thousand freaking views in three hours. Come on, I don't know that it was that much, but hey, look, man, it's a, it's a humbling experience, and I I will say since you brought it up before we get off here. And drop the point on these fools uh, to, like I said in my induction speech, uh, to be good enough at anything in life where your peers or a group of your peers, whether they love you or hate you, um, consider you, swallow their pride and consider you one of the best at what you're doing. Uh, what the hell do you say to that, man? I that. You've seen thousands of Hall of Fame speeches. I want to thank God. I want to thank my wife. I want to thank myself. I want to thank that. What do you say? What What do you say? Um, there's nothing to say other than thank you, but it's like those two words are not enough. Um, to know that all the hard work, all the time, all the editing, all the research, all the behind the scenes communication and just the dedication to honing your craft and getting to know the people you're working with and to know that you've done it all for free, basically, um, for nothing more than a love and a passion for it. If anything, uh, lost money. Yeah. And to, uh, 
for people to validate your career on such a level, and I want to take it one step further, um, to hear th- Junior, uh, let's just cut the shit, Austin, Chris, and yourself, things that you said about me from the heart is something that every human being on this planet longs to hear. And when you hear it, it doesn't seem real. I had to watch it four times back to back before I allowed myself to feel the emotion of the words that were coming out of y'all's mouth. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're very busy people. We're on Messenger all day, all the time, all the time. So you rarely get a chance to really sit down and watch something through from one end to the other. So you got to watch it uh, several times. But uh, I'll quit rambling. I I just want to say it means the world to me because we do what we do for fun. We don't do even the point right here. We don't do this for money. We do this for fun. Two guys talking shit, talking sports, and, and it takes a lot of work. Yeah, but this doesn't compare to the work that goes into that other world. And uh, I don't think people will ever realize, and, and you you probably do, because we talk a lot. Um, anytime I ever cut a promo, I don't just cut a promo. Uh, man, I don't just cut a promo. I mean, I, man, and to, like I said, all that effort that's put into it to be validated like that, man, is truly humbling. Um, to say that I love uh, Haystacks, old school, and uh, Junior, uh, Rising Sun, excuse me, uh, and for shit. You guys are family to me, and you in particular, Ride or Die, you've always been by my side through all this shit, um, in character and out, and that was the greatest night of my career to say the least as well as it should be so any last words I think that was it I didn't have a whole hell of a lot to say tonight other than to kind of chuck you under the bus on that whole situation there yeah well uh, get ready because your day's coming big boy and uh I promise you it'll be one hell of an induction speech because uh, one way or the other, I'm going to be the one inducted. I got to kick somebody's ass to do so. <laughs> I, I just have to do that. But uh, your day's coming. You're good for all that. Ah, uh, hell, you don't either. You're not far from it. But believe, trust, and verify, as the war chain would say. <laughs> uh, I will be the one inducted. But, uh, Stay tuned. Coming at you hard and heavy with the point. Hey, Stacks, again, as always, it's been a pleasure. I know it's late, but we had to get it in and get it on again, as the war chain would say. But uh, it's been another great episode. Ladies and gentlemen, last week's episode, highest numbers we've had yet. Uh, Can't believe it. It wasn't the greatest episode, I didn't think, in my mind, but you guys keep watching. Keep subscribing. We're almost 500 subscribers. Last week's episode was over 7,000 views. Took a while to get going, but it got going. So uh, stay tuned. Hey, click like, subscribe, share, all that good jazz. Stay tuned for the point. And as always, you know we love you. We got to roll. So we'll see you on the flip next week right here. So here we are. The end of another great episode of The Point. Again, thank you all for tuning in, liking, subscribing, sharing, and all that stuff. But what is The Point? Let's get down to it because that's what this show is all about. After all, it is called The Point. What is the point of this week? Well, there's two really. Even amongst all the coronavirus, COVID-19 madness, it's good to know that Every single person on this planet is being affected. Yes, even Vince McMahon. So maybe that's a little bright spot, a little warm, fuzzy feeling for you. But the other point for this week is simply put, 
is Michael Jordan is now, has always been, and will always be the greatest basketball player to touch God's green earth. And you heard it right here from your boy Ricky B. Even in times of strife, Michael Jordan pops up to save us all. Ladies and gentlemen, until next week, it's been your boy, Ricky B. And as always, I love you and I appreciate every damn one of you. Whether you hate me, whether you like me, whether you hate the point, you like the point, you're watching, you're clicking, you're liking, you're subscribing, you're sharing, and all that other jazz. Until next time, next week, stay tuned. We'll be back hot and heavy because, again, the point is not going anywhere anytime soon. Love you. I'm out. Thank you for watching The Point.